Okay, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is John, who's currently a PhD student at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And uh, he spent the first two years of his PhD dabbling with the foundations of quantum mechanics, um, which is about the deep question why nature is described by the laws of quantum mechanics. And nowadays he's working on optimizing quantum circuits using graph theory, such as the ZX calculus. And that's what he's going to talk about today, about his um, project called PyZX. And the talk is about uh, quantum circuit optimization, verification, and simulation with the software tool. So please welcome John. All right. Well, uh, thank, you. thank you for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me here to, to give this talk. So um, in this title, it might be that you don't know what any of these words mean. Like, I hope to like, make it a bit more clear towards the end of the talk. And I'll spend most of the time basically explaining what these things mean and, and like, how we use physics to uh, use it. I know it looks like pi ZX, but like, it's pronounced physics because it's more fun like that. All right, so physics is a Python library that, that you can use to manipulate large ZX diagrams. And like, even if you've heard of quantum circuits, you might not have heard of ZX diagrams. So I will get to explaining to what those are and why you should care about it if you care about quantum computing. Um, yeah, the picture of the plane just to show that like our marketing department is really hard at work trying to get the word out about our project. Um, all right, so just like the basics, um, a quantum computation, like there's multiple ways to do it, but like the most general or like the most straightforward way is to use a quantum circuit. It's basically the quantum analog of a logic circuit in classical computing. Um, and a quantum circuit, you can build it out of quantum gates. And quantum gates are like, you can think of like a quantum circuit with quantum gates as sort of the assembly language of a quantum computer. So they contain sort of abstracted basic instructions for your computer. Um, and these gates have names like NOT gate, S gate, T gate, H gate. Uh, NOT gate is probably familiar to, to you all. Uh, there's others, maybe not. So the way you should understand these single qubit gates, so they do a transformation on just a single qubit. And a qubit you can sort of see as a sphere called the block sphere. And if you compare this to, like, to, uh, to classical computing, you would have like a zero and a one state. And the zero and one state, you can see the zero lives up here at the north pole of the block sphere, the one state lives down here. So a not gate you can see is like a 180 degree rotation that flips the two poles like this. But the special thing about quantum computing is you don't just have the poles you can use, you can use any position on this sphere and manipulate it. So for representation of what a qubit, like in what state it can be. And then these other gates, like the Hadamard gate, S gate, T gate, they co correspond to different types of rotations on this block sphere. There are different types of operations you can do in the qubit. For instance, Hadamard gate interchanges the Z and X axis, so like it makes a a, a state, like a zero state, and it puts it on like the equator, which is, like makes it a superposition of two states. And these other gates are like, there's also, this is a, a half rota a quarter rotation, the T gate is like a one H rotation. Um, I use these specific gates for a reason, which will come in like a few minutes. And there's basically only one two qubit gate that you need to know about, which is called the controlled not gate. And what this simply does is it has two qubits, and I look at my first qubit, and if it's in the zero state, I don't do anything. If it's in the one state, then I flip the bit of the second qubit. So this is just a classical operation, but then you do this classical operation on two qubits. So these are all the gates you need. You can actually do any quantum computation using just these, um, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five gates. So like, this is all you need to know about quantum computing, basically, because then you can do any computation you want, which is like, it's hard to show this is actually true, but it does work. Um, yeah, and so the motivation behind this talk and what I will talk about is quantum circuit optimization. So taking a sim the, the same quantum circuit, but like somehow reducing the number of gates in it while still performing the same computation, which is like analogous to what, what, uh, what advanced compilers do for classical computers, but now I want to do it for a quantum computer. All right. So these uh, quantum circuits, you have a special notation to write them down, sort of a graphical way to see them. And we have a special notation for the NOT gate, it's just like this like XOR symbol, and then the controlled NOT gate is like an XOR, but now it has a control wire attached to it. 
and we just compose them into a quantum circuit. So each line here represents a qubit. So this is three qubits, and it just the time goes from left to right, and it just says, on my first qubit, do a T gate, on my third qubit, do a NOT gate, then do a C NOT gate between the first and the second, etc. You just do these operations in a row. So it tells you what instructions do I need to do on my quantum computer. Um, well, quite interestingly, you have different circuits that represent the same computation, and like you have certain identities for these things. For instance, if I do two control NOT gates on the same qubits in a row, it's equivalent to doing nothing, because like these NOTs cancel each other out. And similarly, doing two Hadamard gates cancel each other out, these things also hold. So you have some circuit identities, which you can start to use to simplify your, your quantum circuits you're using. Um, this is a bit complicated by the fact that some operations commute past one another. So if I have two uh, C not case, for instance, which like put a knot on the same qubit, like it doesn't matter in which order I do them, so I can flip them. So combining these two things of cancellations and commuting, you can already see like it starts to add up what kind of simplifications you could do on your quantum circuit. And in fact, like you can do like a lot more of these simplification rules, and even more, and like lots more. And like this list just goes on and on, and people have been finding more elaborate lists to do better quantum circuit simplification. But like this gets really unwieldy very quickly. And basically the reason why you need so many rules is because the structure of a quantum circuit is very rigid. It's like it has a definite time ordering, you need to do this thing in this order, you have a definite amount of qubits, you can't increase the amount of qubits or decrease the amount of qubits intermediately. It's very strict what you can do. And this is where we use the ZX diagrams to, to uh, come over this problem. So, so the diagrams, well, what we have, we have circuits, and circuits consist of gates. And the next diagram consists of what we call spiders. And these spiders come in two flavors, which we call Z spiders and X spiders, and they have these two colors, green and red. Well, if you're colorblind, it'll probably be light gray and uh, dark gray for the X spider. And Contrary to a quantum circuit, we can wire these things in any, in any way or shape we want. So it's just like a graph, and I just say I want to connect all these things together. Um, and there's no, like, um, we, can, we can still say there's like, a, there's like a time order where things go from left to right, but it's no longer really necessary. And only the connectivity matters. So I can like just move these things and, and, and continuously deform the thing, and it represents the same computation or the same linear map. So for instance, this one has two inputs and three outputs. So this would be a linear map from two qubits as an input to three qubits as an output. Um, and we can write every quantum gate as a ZX diagram. So for instance, the S gate is just a single spider with a single input, single output, and a pi over two phase. So if you remember, an S gate was a, was a quarter rotation among, among the block sphere. So pi over two is like a quarter rotation on the sphere, so you see it here, and the T gate was like was like, um, like a 1 8 rotation, so we see a pi of 4 appearing here. The Hadamard gate can be decomposed into like sort of three uh, basic rotations, so we compose these three rotations together to get this more complicated Hadamard gate. And because the Hadamard gate is so important, we introduce a new symbol for it, this yellow square. And then a C not gate, a controlled not gate, is just a composition of two spiders in this particular manner. Um, and the reason we write is like vertical lines because like it doesn't matter in which direction you do it. So you can see this in two different causal orderings, basically. And it actually turns out that you can represent any linear map between any number of qubits as a ZX diagram. So this is a universal language to talk about quantum, about, to talk about quantum computing. All right? Um, and the reason we, 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 we like using ZX diagrams is because they come with a set of graphical rewrite rules. So if I have a ZX diagram, then I can change it according to, these, to, to this set of graphical rewrite rules, and it will still represent the same, same linear map, the same quantum computation. So for instance, the rule here at the left at the top, it, basically, it tells me that if I have two spiders of the same color, of so the same type, that are connected, I can just fuse them together. And like the phases on it, they add up. And, like, and this one tells me what the Hadamard gate does with a spider. So it says that if I have a Hadamard gate in front of a spider, I can push it through the spider, and it changes the color of the spider. So these kind of rules are just very, like, once you get, the, once you get used to them a bit, it's very natural to see what you can do. It's like, oh, I have a Hadamard gate, let's push it through. Oh, I have two spiders of the same color, let's fuse them together. Um, and this is just a small set of rewrite rules. And it turns out, that if you add one more rule, which is a bit complicated to specify, then this rule set is complete. 
So that means that if I have two diagrams and they represent the same quantum computation, I know there is a set of rewrite rules that will bring me from one thing to the other. So like the, the dozens of circuit inequalities as I showed in the beginning, like you can all replace them with just these rules plus one more, and then you have a complete set of, of, of equations. All right? So this is why we're, why we're using ZX calculus, because it's a really powerful graphical tool to reason about quantum computation. Yeah, so instead of dots and circuit equalities, just a few simple rules. Uh, and this brings me to uh, why I'm here, uh, which is physics. So physics is an open source Python library. Uh, you can find it on GitHub now if you want. And the goal is that you can uh, import uh, quantum circuits and like transform them into like large ZX diagrams and simplify the ZX diagrams in an automatic manner and hopefully do interesting stuff with it. Uh, particularly, we originally developed it for a quantum circuit optimization, but then we found out it also works really good for quantum circuit verification, so uh, verifying that two quantum circuits actually implement the same unitary, the same, uh, the same computation. And something we're working on right now is doing quantum circuit simulation, so um, basically simulating what a quantum computer would do with this thing uh, on a classical computer, uh, which, and uh, yeah, so these three things. And I'm going to give a bit of a demo to see to show you how this works in physics. Um, let's see how much time do I have left? Ooh, I think I have a lot of time. Cool. All right. So this is just a Jupyter notebook, which I guess many of you have seen. Um, I'm just going to start with a few basic imports. The important import here is import physics as ZX. By the way, is this uh, large enough for ev for everyone? Like, can anybody uh, see it in the back? Right. And now I'm just going to start with, um, with presenting like just a simple circuit. And this uses uh, the chasm uh, notation, which is kind of like an assembly language for, uh, for quantum circuits. So I'm just going to say I have two qubits, and I'm going to do a CX, which is a controlled not gate between the first qubit and, between, and the second qubit. And then I'm going to draw the circuit. And so, and we get this thing out, which, like, as I said, like the C not get is represented by these two connected spiders. And to show you this is actually a, a ZX diagram and not a circuit, I can just move this stuff around. So it's not like, a, like an actual rigid thing. It's just a thing you can move around. Um, and we can also convert it to a matrix to see it actually is like the linear map it should be. And like, if you know anything about quantum computing, you know about the C not gate, there should be a one here, a one here, and a one here, and a one there. And there has to be zeros. So it's great that works. Okay, so let's do a bit more uh, complicated circuit. So this is just a few C not gates in a different orientation. It's, uh, it's an S gate, and it's uh, the inverse of an S gate, and then some more rotation gates. Um, I can just if I want, I can just represent these, uh, these gates as, like a, as just a list of sort of simple representations. Uh, and I can convert it into an actual ZX diagram. And I see like this is just like a graph with 14 vertices and 15 edges. And now we can start to simplify it. So if we look here at this thing, we see that we have these two green spiders that are connected to one another. So I know that the spider fusion rule tells me that I can fuse these things together into a single spider. And the same here for the red one, it's also connected to this red one, so I can sort of fuse them together. So we have a function that does that, it's called spider simp. And we can fuse them together, and we need to see that this thing is now a single node, and it's fused together like this. Well, we have a bit of more uh, powerful rewrite strategy, we call a full reduce, which applies like a certain heuristic set of rewrite rules we've developed. And it actually managed to re reduce this complete diagram, and it just becomes a swap gate, which if you're a bit familiar with quantum circuits, you see three C nodes in this configuration, which should read as a swap gate, and then like this pi of four goes through the swap gate and cancels with this one, and this one goes through the swap gate and cancels with this one. So that's kind of what our simplification is doing automatically, and it makes it into a swap gate. Okay. So now let's do a bit more complicated stuff. Um, so a thing I haven't explained really is what are your metrics for optimization in a quantum circuit? Right, so like, what are the things that you want to minimize when you want to implement a quantum circuit on a quantum computer? And this depends heavily on what architecture you have for your physical quantum computer. Um, for near-term quantum computers, the most obvious metric is um, total gate count and two qubit gate count. Total gate count is obvious, right? If you have less gates, it's better 
Um, and, if, and the two qubit gates especially, because usually they introduce more noise to your uh, computation and they take more time to perform. And also, like, they're far apart, so maybe you have to do some extra work to actually make it happen. So those are the two metrics you really care about for, like, near term quantum computing. There's also depth, but, like, don't worry about that. But if you're thinking about, like, far ahead, fault-tolerant quantum computation, um, then the metrics sort of change, and, and some things become easier to do, some things become harder to do. And a thing that becomes particularly hard to implement in a fault-tolerant manner is the T-gate. Um, this is for technical reasons. If you really want to know, come to me after, and I'll explain all about it. Uh, but so, like, an important goal for quantum circuit optimization for the fault-tolerant quantum computers is minimizing the number of T-counts, of the, the number of T-gates. So you have this a special method that does this. Um, I'm just going to show one example. So we have this slightly bigger circuit. It's an actual uh, benchmark circuit we've been using. It's, um, uh, I think it implements uh, a classical reversible function that calculates um, whether uh, the first four bits modulo four are zero or something, um, and then stores the answer in the fifth qubit. But anyway, uh, so this qubit, is, uh, this circuit is a bit longer. Um, and we see it has, it has 28 T gates. So that's like the metric you want to improve with this method. So I apply this optimizer and I draw the resulting circuit. And I get something that's indeed shorter, so that looks good. And if I look at the stats, it's indeed T counts reduced to 8. So we went from 28 T gates to 8 T gates. And this is actually the best known T gate for this circuit right now. Like, be before we did this work, it was 16, and we reduced it to 8. And, like, now there's other people that also get this number. But it's, uh, um, so, to get a bit, a bit, bit of an idea, because this is right now a bit of a black box where, like, I just put in a circuit and get something out. Like, what is this doing behind the scenes? Well, let me just um, rerun this simplification. And I see, like, it does in the background, it does, like, a lot of stuff. It fuses on spiders. Moves some identities. It does this thing, which I haven't talked about at all, but like it's a bit complicated. And in the end, the result that you get is like something. Uh, this next diagram looks like this. Um, and there should be two things you notice about this. First, it does not look. Like, it does not look like a circuit at all. Right? It looks like some weird jumble of wires. And second, there's these blue wires. So that's kind of like a, a shortcut for a wire with a Hadamard gate on it, because otherwise there would be Hadamard gates floating everywhere, and that looks terrible. So we just use a blue wire. Um, so with this thing, there's basically two problems you have to solve, which is how do you get from this arbitrary diagram back into a circuit diagram? And we found a few ways to do it, which are a bit much to go into now, but if you want to know more, just ask me later. Um, yeah, so this is kind of what's happening in the background, and we use this information to uh, get an optimized circuit back out. Um, so that's circuit optimization, what I want to talk about. Now let's get to circuit equality verification. So I've I've now shown you that like, I get this starting circuit and I output a new circuit. But like, how do you know that they represent the same, the same computation, right? So I can, I can do it like, the easy way, which is I can just calculate the matrix that each, is, each of these computations, and I just compare the matrices and see if they're equal. And if they're equal, then I know I've done the same computation. But of course, the entire reason we care about quantum computation is that these matrices aren't easy, aren't easy to compute. They, they take exponential memory in a number of qubits. So like this uh, runs into problems quite quickly. So what we've developed instead, I mean for this case it's five qubits, you can just do it manually, but what we've developed is a method which is, uh, I, I take in two circuits, which of which I want to know if they're equal, and I take the first circuit, and I take the inverse of the second circuit, and then I compose them, and if the circuits are equal, they should be implementing the identity uh, operation, right? Because like, if they're equal, I do, I do the thing, I do the inverse of the thing, nothing happens. So what we've done, we, we do this, and then we use our simpl a simplification strategy from ZX and see if it completely reduces to the identity. And if it does, then we have a, then, then, then we have a, 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 a certificate of equality that indeed these things are equal. So for this circuit, I can just run it, and it indeed says true these things are equal, which, like, let me show you a bit more detail what actually happens in this function. So. First, I, I copy like, the, original fun the original circuit. Then I add to that the inverse of the, of the other circuit. So now C2 should contain an, an identity circuit. Then I make it, make it into a select diagram. I reduce it fully, 
with our simplification strategy. And let me just draw it, and we indeed see, sorry, we indeed see that it's a completely to that entity, so nothing happens, all right? And to show you that I'm actually not cheating, let me change a single gate in uh, the, the first, the, the optimized circuit, so now it should contain an error. And if you verify equality, and he says false, they're not equal. And if we do it manually, we see that like we have some leftover gates, so it's indeed not that entity. All right. So that's verification for a bit. And now the last thing I want to talk about, and let's see, how much time do I have? You still have um, Oof, that's a lot. All right. Um, Yes, the last thing I want to talk about is simulation, right? So let me just get another circuit here that's even a bit bigger. Uh, there's a T count of, of, of one out of five, so it's a bit more complicated circuit. It's uh, nine qubits here. So if I have a circuit like this, so what I would usually do in a quantum computer, right, is I would have some simple starting state, like usually just always like the old zero state. And then I would apply my chosen quantum circuit to it, and now my quantum system is in some state that I want to know something about because I've done this computation and want to learn something about it. So possibly I will measure a few of the qubits. I will get some outcomes, some zeros and ones. And maybe I need to do the computation like a few thousand times to get enough statistics to actually derive something meaningful from it. Like uh, the Google experiment that showed quantum supremacy a while back. Like they did the same experiment like 40,000 times or whatever. So like you need to do it a lot of times. And then, and then in the end you get some, you get some, basically some probabilities out of some samples and then hopefully you can use that to do something useful, right? So what you want to do in classical simulation is you want to do this problem, this what I just described, then on a classical computer. Which of course is going to be hard, because if it was easy we wouldn't care about quantum computers. Um, so there's like a lot of research being done in trying to uh, do this in smart ways. And like you, you already see this like, um, um, if you heard anything about the, 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 the Google announcement of quantum supremacy where they claimed to have a computation that, um, that uh, did something that the classical computer could never do, and they said like a classical computer would take 40,000 years, so like a long amount of time to do it, and then IBM a day later said, well actually it would only take two days if you do it in this way. So like, there's a lot of like, depending on how you do it, like the numbers differ, differ uh, immensely. And also we've gotten a lot better at classically simulating quantum systems. Um, so, uh, and there's, there's, there's two methods, there's basically two methods right now that people use to do simulation quantum circuits. And the first is relatively straightforward, is I just, I prepare my initial uh, quantum state and I represent it as some huge vector, like some huge matrix of elements in my, in my classical computer. And then each gate that I apply it, I just modify this vector a little bit and I keep track of the entire vector the whole time. And in the end, I just do something with this vector. And this takes exponential amount of memory in a number of qubits. Which, uh, yeah, makes sense. And there's some smart things you can do to exploit sort of symmetries in the circuit or sparsity, or whatever, to make this faster. But like this has sort of a hard limit around 70, 80, 90 qubits, maybe in the future if we get better at this. Um, so that's like the first method. Uh, the second method uses something called stabilizer decompositions. And I don't want to go into the details there because it's really complicated, but. Um, the interesting thing about that is it doesn't scale with a number of qubits. So you could have a circuit with thousands of qubits and you could still simulate it with stabilized decompositions. Stabilized decompositions scale with the number of T gates used. So if I have a circuit with a few T gates, even though it's many qubits, I can still easily simulate it using the stabilized decompositions. And that's the method we've implemented in physics. So, um, let me just uh, do a bit of simplification with the circuit and I'll explain a bit more about this. So first, like we have the circuit, we can just simplify the physics and we get this complicated looking ZX diagram with like lots of connections here. And now what I wanna do is I wanna like, I wanna know some property about the circuit. So the property I wanna know is I wanna input some states. So this tells me just like apply this state, like put the state in the beginning of the circuit. And this says apply effect. So effect basically tells me I want to know the probability that uh, this particular outcome happens. So I just, I, I basically ask this now, like if I were to run this circuit on this input state, what's the probability I get this output, right? And I just reduce it and the output I get is this ZX diagram. And now we see this ZX diagram has no inputs, there's no incoming wires on the left. And if I scroll a bit to the right, 
we also see that it has no output wires to the right. So it also has no outputs, which makes sense because I expect a number, right? I expect a probability to come out of this. So we have this complicated diagram and now this thing represents like the number I want to know. And so what I could do is I could just, for each of these spiders, I can represent this matrix and I can contract all these matrix like with like tensor network methods. And I could do that. And for a small circle like this, that would work. Um, but the other way I could do is like each of these individual spiders, I can cut the spider open basically into two bits. And then uh, this would give me two separate diagrams. And then each of these diagrams, I can then calculate the value. And if I sum those values together, I still get the original outcome. So I can do this for this spider, I get, I get two diagrams, but if I also split this one, then I get two diagrams for each of those two, so I have four diagrams. And I can do it for this one, and then I get two again for those, so I get eight. So we see these scales exponentially with the number of spiders that are left here. And in particular, it scales exponentially with the spiders that have an odd multiple of five or four, because those basically correspond to your T gates, which are like the hard part when doing this method. So, um, well, it turns out that uh, actually the best way to do this is not to split open each individual spider, because that takes two, you get two copies per spider. It turns out for complicated reasons that the best way to do it is you take six spiders and you decompose them with seven terms. And like these are just numbers that have to come out of this research. Um, and, um, and then, so you still get uh, like exponential uh, scaling. Because like if I have six of these spiders that I want to split open, I get, um, I get seven terms. If I have 12, I get seven times seven is 49. If I have 18, I get seven times seven times seven. So it scales exponentially. And you can easily calculate that like the amount of terms you would need to simulate this, or like to calculate this value using this method, which require 67,000 diagrams, 67,000 simplifications. But the interesting thing we can do now using ZX diagrams is whenever I cut open these spiders, then the resulting diagram I get is simpler and is smaller. So then I can rerun my simplification strategy on this, this new diagram, and hopefully this cancels out some of the, some of the additional structure. So instead of replacing uh, six spiders with seven diagrams, then each of these seven diagrams, I can hopefully find some further reductions that will make my diagram smaller and require the next step to be like less painful, basically. So we implemented that, and if you do it on this circuit, and it takes a while to compute, because uh, we haven't really thought about optimizing this yet, but it's now computing, like, it's basically doing this thing where like it replaces six spiders by seven terms, and each of these terms it's uh, gonna simplify, and then it replaces again six by seven, et cetera. And then in the end, we should see that I think my laptop's on battery saving mode. Yeah, it's also um, the way it chooses these spiders is, is random, so like on different runs it takes a different amount of terms, but ah, yeah. So it took 8,865 terms. So naively I would use 67,000 terms to do this, and with our method we would use like 9,000 terms. It's like a, nine times less. And like, and this scales up, right? Because like this is exponential behavior. So if you want to simulate bigger diagrams, this helps more and more. So like now it's actually slower than doing it directly, but uh, yeah, like if you have bigger diagrams, it should hopefully be better. So this is something we're working on now to see if this actually is better than the, what's the state of the art that people are using with this method. Um, yeah, and uh, so sure it actually gives the correct answer. So uh, this way we're decomposing everything. We got the answer that the number we were calculating was this number. And if we calculate it directly, but just doing a simple method, we also get the same answer. So, like, it is indeed correct. So that's nice. Um, and yeah, that's basically what I wanted to tell you. Um, I realize if you've never seen this stuff before, it might be a lot. Um, if you want to know more, like, go to our GitHub. We have some links to learn more about it. There's also a website, zedexcalculus.com, where there's some resources in order to like learn a bit more about ZX. Uh, if you really think like, oh, this is awesome and I want to learn all about it, but I know nothing about quantum computing or quantum theory or whatever, I can highly recommend this book, which appeared like two years ago. 
it builds up the entire foundation of quantum theory using the language of these diagrams and selects calculus. So it's sort of like a graphical approach to like quantum computing, basically. Um, and with that advertisement, I thank you for your attention. So we have time for one or two questions. If uh, anybody has uh, something on their mind they would like to ask the speaker. Uh, thanks for a great talk, yeah, very interesting. Um, I was curious about the optimization. Um, maybe you said it, but maybe I missed it. So can I choose what I want to optimize using this? Uh, Sorry, you choose what? What I want to optimize, like if I want to optimize T count or total gate count or... Uh, That's an interesting else. question. Um, so for a long time, uh, we found that, um, so that there's two ways we can use our optimization. There's uh, the thing I used here, which is called teleport reduce, and it's basically only doing T count, T -count optimization. And then the second thing you can do, which we call a re-extraction. So like I get this very compact select diagram, and then I need to make it back into a circuit. And uh, there's a ways to do it, which quite are, is quite involved, but you can actually do it. And this results in a new circuit, which usually looks completely different than the original one. And what we found is that, unfortunately, this usually has more C0 gates than what you started out with. Although, like, we've recently done some, some uh, improvements to the algorithm, and now it works a lot better. Although, on some circuits, it's still worse. On other circuits, we actually get way better results than other people. So it's kind of dependent on the type of circuit you're optimizing, whether it helps. There is currently no easy way to see when you should do this and uh, like to um, apply this. So the answer to your question is not really. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question actually on uh, the practical uh, way of using your uh, algorithm. So have been, uh, did you use that for a true implementation, like with optics, having a circuit complicated and creating uh, an optimized one? Um, sorry, I, I, I missed the first bit, but can you, could you repeat? Uh, so this is, this is a, th a theoretical way of optimizing circuits. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there is several uh, implementation of quantum uh, computing um, and photonics. Mm -hmm. is, have, have you done some experiment using this technique on optimizing circuits using photonics, for example? Um, no, like the, most of the benchmark circuits we've used are these, um, they basically implement like classical reversible logic, so they implement adders or Grover oracles or stuff like that. We haven't looked at um, things for photonics. We have implemented a few quantum chemistry circuits, and those seem to work really well as well. But uh, if you have some suggestions on what we should try, then um, you can tell me afterwards. I could, uh, try. Cool. Last question. This looks like we're good, so let's thank the speaker.